Good morning, everybody. My name is John Turbush. I am a co-author of the SAN SEC 587 Advanced OSINT class, and I want to welcome you all to our special live stream this morning. And I have a couple of my co-authors here this morning with me, Nico Dakins and David Mashburn. If you guys want to say hi real quick. Um, hey, good morning, everybody. Nico Dagens, also known as the Dutch Ocean Guy, SANS instructor. David, take it away. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, David Mashburn. I am also a certified SANS instructor, and I work in as a CISO in higher ed uh, with a background in incident response and investigation. So we are going to be talking this morning about maritime investigations and open source intelligence work. Uh, this is, can involve tracking ships using the AIS system, um, which is sort of a, a radio identification system, automatic identification system. Uh, you can also use other methods like the International Maritime Organization numbers, ship names, and all this sort of thing to kind of track data, as well as imagery and other things. Uh, so our special guest today is our friend Ray. She is known uh, Wondersmith Ray on Twitter. Ray Baker, welcome. Tell us a little about yourself. Hi, glad to be here. Um, I work in Cyber Recon as a senior OSINT analyst um, by day, <laughs> a maritime enthusiast by night. Uh, I fell into this role by accident. I wrote a blog on Maritime, and it just kind of blew up, and here I am. Awesome. Well, you, I know, have a lot of knowledge in this area. We have, you and I have <laughs> chatted about this quite a bit. This is sort of an interest area of mine, although I haven't done a ton of investigations in this space. I know that you have. So uh, definitely want to get you to share some of your expertise on this day. It is St. Patrick's Day, by the way. So for those of you who celebrate that, <laughs> happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, but let's just go ahead and get into it. Uh, speaking of St. Patrick, he was allegedly kidnapped by Irish pirates. Uh, have you done any sort of uh, tracking of piracy or looking at that sort of thing, right? Um, I... <laughs> I look at it just because it's fun. I haven't actually had a reason to track it yet. Um, there is a piracy map that you can go and look at and see all the recent piracy things that happen. Um, but actually, I believe piracy is down right now. So I, I haven't had too much of a reason with the world, you know, crazy right now to, to look into piracy. But There's it is interesting lot. to me. There's a lot of other stuff going on in the world, in case you've missed it. The invasion of Ukraine, for example. Um, maybe let's talk a little bit about that. There's a lot of people that's that's really hot right now, as they say. There's a lot of people looking at ships in the Black Sea and seeing where uh, wealthy people from Russia are moving their yachts and all of that. Um, let's talk about that a little bit. Ray, have you... Have you peeked into any of this, uh, what kind of stuff are we seeing there? I mean, of course, I've, I've peeked into that. <laughs> it's pretty much all I've been doing for the past month. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I've been keeping tabs on <clears throat> all the movement in the Black Sea and surrounding area. It's kind of hard with Russian vessels because uh, especially Russian military vessels, they turn off their AIS. So you really need like a secondary source to verify what you're seeing, um, which is where Twitter and ship spotting and those types of things come in. Um, but yes, I've been keeping keeping track of all the places that things are and monitoring them. Um, also, the yachts you mentioned, that's kind of that's a, a fun side project to to help track down the oligarch yachts um, for a project Klepto Capture. Uh, just, I mean, people have made like bingo cards of all the cuts and, and social media is just kind of tag teaming, finding them, which is kind of funny crowdsourcing, you know, taking down oligarch. Absolutely. Yeah. Speaking of crowdsourcing, uh, 
welcome to everybody who's joined the stream this morning. If you do have some questions, things we're talking about, or, or things we haven't that you're interested in, feel free to drop those into the uh, little chat, and um, we'll try and take some of those up this morning. So um, speaking of Russian vessels and tracking, sometimes you have ships where the AIS system is is not functioning, they're military vessels, or they turn it off for other reasons, maybe they're doing something criminal. Um, China recently has uh, basically said, you know, we're shutting the system off. We're not going to be sharing this kind of information publicly if we can avoid it. Have you seen, obviously there are effects of this, uh, if you're looking at that part of the world at all. <laughs> what have you? What sort of effect have you seen from this, Ray? I mean, I think if you're looking at that area, you you saw a bunch of ships, and then they were all gone. <laughs> I mean, instantly they kind of turned everything off, and there was just like open areas, and everybody was kind of like, "What? What happened?" And then, you know, they realized that 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 was enacted, and ships don't have to turn their AIS on, which is a little bit scary. Um, I feel like they should have it on, but <laughs> maybe that's selfish because I want to track them. But um, yeah. yeah, I think I think we saw a big drop off in um, ships in the area that we could see. So, so uh, when you basically have a, a large blind spot, that's what you're saying, yeah. right? So, what are tools or techniques that you are using to to tackle that blind spot because i do see some people online that are doing OSINT as well as yourself that are still well let's say somewhat capable of spotting those chinese or russian ships so so can you tell us how would you tackle that issue yeah so so OSINT in maritime is kind of hard because uh, all the tools are pretty much pay i mean there's a paywall you get a little bit you know you can track it during the day but anything historical, you have to pay for. Um, satellite imagery, you have to pay for. Um, but the good thing is other people have it. <laughs> so you can go on to things like Twitter or YouTube or whatever. And people, if they're interested in these things, in these you know, areas where lots of things happen, the Black Sea, you know, near Taiwan, things like that, um, there are other people doing this. So they might be like innocuously sharing just pictures that they take for fun at a port. But to you, that's, you know, intel. That's, that's information you've now verified what you think you know about a ship. Is somebody took a picture of it and this, you know, name is painted off the side or, or something. Uh, so I personally use a lot of social media. Um, thank you to everyone who shares, <laughs> shares the tools they have uh, because I use a lot of it. Um, you know, and I can, you can create like a tweet deck and you can follow all these people for free. Um, so for people who do not know, tweet deck is a free tool provided by Twitter that lets you set up columns where you can monitor keywords or videos or audio that are being posted on Twitter by Twitter users. Yeah, so, it's, it's mo mostly for marketing, um, marketing teams to keep track of things and hashtags mm -hmm. and whatever. But you know, it comes in very handy for me when I have to track a <clears throat> hundred people who are talking about a certain ship. And there are also some, you know, kind of ship spotter uh, people that follow military vessels like H.I. Sutton's Covert Shores and some of these other sites um, that sort of specialize in certain areas of maritime, for example. And if you are doing investigations in those areas, you definitely want to find some of those and check them out. They there's a lot of them actually yeah. if you're looking. And like, so, like if you're looking at, <laughs> sorry, if you're looking at like oil tankers, which is kind of a big thing that, that maritime people look at because of all the sanctions and, and oil transfers and things like that to countries who aren't supposed to be getting the oil. Um, you can look at tanker trackers. They put out a lot of free information about uh, vessels who are, you know, some, sometimes they'll repaint their entire deck so that when you see them on satellite, they look like a different ship or they lay out tarps across the whole deck, which seems ridiculous to me. It's fun to, to kind of monitor, but um, tanker trackers is great for that. So pivoting back to a comment made earlier about uh, either AIS signals being off, do you find that it's more difficult to track just 
being off or being spoofed because kind of since we're really in the age of disinformation, especially with all that's happened in Eastern Europe over the last month or so, um, which is kind of a bigger challenge for you, just the lack of signal and trying to find other sources or something that's intentionally trying to mislead you and essentially waste your time in the investigation? Um, I think it's harder when it's just dark because you don't really know what you're looking for or where they might be. I mean, you know, oftentimes when you're looking at these paths, you see the beginning, you see them go somewhere, they disappear, they come back in another spot. And you can kind of guess, you know, if you calculate the amount of time that they were dark and the areas and the ports nearby where they may have gone. And in some areas that might be like 40 ports that they could have made right. in that time. Um, if they're spoofing, it's usually for a reason. Um, whether they're transferring oil to another ship, you might be able to track the other ship. Um, are they going to port to deliver something they're not supposed to do? You might be able to see a picture of it in the port. Um, things like that. You, you, there's, I feel like there's more opportunities to find it when it's spoofing than there is if it's just like going dark out of nowhere. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, I, I remember, um, I think it was even from one of your blogs, Ray, that you also wrote about um, ship personnel. So the people who are actually <laughs> sailing on those ships. And I recently had an example where uh, one of these ships went dark-ish, let me formulate it like that. But I was still able to track them somewhat based upon social media uses because they were able, they were, let's say, shooting out images from that ship that was no longer uh, sending out radio signals, but they were sending out pictures, or at least the personnel was. So yeah. is that something that you now still see as an added value to track the people who are actually on that ship? Oh, 100%. 100%. If, if they're dark, there's lots of ways to track them. One is if they're meeting with another vessel, um, you can track that vessel. Are they getting deliveries to the vessel? Like if it's military, they probably have to get supplies. What's supplying them? Can you track the flight? Um, they obviously have people on them and people talk. So can you track the people that are on there? I mean, they're, I've seen walkthroughs of an entire vessel on YouTube. Like they take the camera, they walk through, they show the engine room, they show all the papers on the desks, all the systems. And it might seem, you know, it's a sanitized area. You're just showing like, uh, you know, an organized desk, but I'm seeing all the systems that are you're using in there. I, I mean, how much does it take to go and look for a vulnerability for whatever they're using? Um, it's not very hard. So when they're posting their TikToks or snap, Snapchats from the vessel, we're getting information. Are they standing in front of something? You can see a mountain behind them or, you know, there's, there's so much they're posting and LinkedIn, you know, they're posting that they worked on this vessel, um, you know, what they worked on, to what systems they use. If it's military, they're posting that for sure, mm -hmm. because that's their resume. Um, there's a lot of things that alone don't seem like a big deal, but when you combine them, you know, that's, that's OSINT, that's intelligence. You're, you're creating that intelligence from the, from all those little pieces that mean nothing by themselves. So we've got a few questions coming in from people on the stream. So I thought maybe kind of pick at a couple of those and have you share your experience with that. So one of them uh, kind of working from kind of very fundamental level is, so you see a ship's image or a video, it, what do you follow there in terms to try to identify the vessel or classify the ship or really try to identify, I mean, you know, kind of starting with some things where people may have no background in, in maritime OSINT, how would you start to identify these vessels? Uh, for, yeah, from a ship, from a ship photo or a video, um, they often have their IMO printed on the side if it's a big vessel like a tanker or a cargo vessel. So the IMO is basically their their number, their like VIN number. Um, so often, if they haven't illegally changed it, <laughs> you can <laughs> use that to track it. Um, uh, a lot of ships look completely different, so you can use just the visual. Uh, you can go on to, I mean, I have a, I have a, a lot of luck just going into Twitter and typing a ship name, <laughs> a ship name or an IMO and someone, if it's an important ship, someone has looked it up. Someone has tracked it. Someone has put it there. Uh, YouTube people have tracked it. And, and often you can just pick out like little things from all of these and put them together and figure out what you're looking at. We, we have another question from Robin uh, concerning satellite and not just um, optical imagery, but using uh, 
SAR or SAR radar imagery. And if you've used any of this before for tracking. I do, uh, again, yeah, a lot of it's pay. There is free stuff, but the problem I have with satellite is it's very, you know, the satellite passes maybe an area once a day. Maybe it goes over more if it's like a more high traffic area that they're, they're targeting. Um, so if you're looking for a vessel that maybe visited a port at 9 a.m. on Thursday, you have to hope that a satellite went over at that exact time to catch it, um, which sometimes is ideal weather conditions. Uh, yes, and, it has, and no um, fog. Yeah, which again, radar can help with some there, but um, yes, sometimes not. You, you just it's, have it's issues very there with, with the time and frequency, as well as hey, can you even see this? You know. Yeah, and then you get into a high traffic area um where that like you know suez canal or something where there's like hundreds of ships just kind of there you have to find the exact ship so if you're looking at a tanker that looks like five thousand other tankers you have to measure it by size and width and color of the deck and you know whatever else you can use to satellites very hard it's very rewarding because you can verify what you're seeing on ais which is not something you can trust um but it's very hard what, what, what kind of sources that are maybe free that our users can take a look at would, would you recommend that you say, hey, those have worked for me? I use SOAR, um, S-O-A-R, SOAR, uh, I forget what dot something. Um, but I use that sometimes for, um, it has sent, sentinel images and things like that. I use that. Um, and then again, I go into Twitter or, you know, Google and just Google the ship and or maybe the port and someone someone has tracked it. Usually I can find their satellite images from planet or um, usually planet. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, the idea of like a, someone basically changing their IMO. Is there kind of a telltale characteristic when one is fake versus real? I mean, obviously we could look up the IMO number and say it doesn't match the expected characteristics of the vessel. Are, are there other just kind of dead giveaways? And, and what's the kind of frequency with which you run into things like uh, fake IMOs? So often. Okay. <laughs> so, so often. No, um, no, this is obviously because you are looking yes. at bad stuff, right? Right, you're looking I at mean, certain Make bad clear bad. that it's not like half the vessels out there have fake IMOs. There are, uh, yes, there are a lot of vessels. The ones I'm looking at are mostly changing their IMOs. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. So, uh, so the the way I usually tell is that you can see over time that they bounce back and forth what they're reporting. Um, or if you get an, an image, there have been some where they change the name on the side, but their IMO is the same. And then they change their IMO and the name is the same. Like you basically have to look historically, I think, if you don't have some sort of paid service that will tell you, because a lot of them do tell you if there's IMO uh, identity changes in their Mimsy number or their IMO number or just their name. They're switching their name. Um, but they, yeah, this happens all the time. It's like a, a, a big thing to look out for. What they do is they'll, they'll share them. Um, they might have a fleet of vessels and they have, they'll use one IMO. They'll switch it. They'll go do whatever they're not supposed to be doing. They'll switch it back. Um, military vessels do this. <laughs> They will uh, change their IMOs when they're doing, they'll, they'll share them um, and they'll switch it to another ship. So you're watching that one while that, the other one goes and does something and they'll switch it back. Um, it, it's all to just obscure what, what they're doing, the activities, whether it's good activities or, or bad. Yeah. It made me think of one example when um, in the Netherlands a couple of years ago, we had the nuclear science summit where let's say all the world leaders came and interestingly, yeah. I was then in law enforcement and we started monitoring, let's say, the sea line. And, and, and in the week coming to that, we saw all kinds of fisher ships entering our water yes. with a bunch of antennas on them. Mm -hmm. So if you found those ships, their, their IMO number or their AIS number, and then you started looking at the picture, they're like, hmm, fisher ships with like 55 antennas. That's yeah, like, like a joke, a joke oh, yeah. in the Cold War about Russian fishing trawlers with 
more antennas than you could count, right? Yeah, well, those are just special, you know, fishing lines. Come on, guys. Get a <laughs> I'm just being paranoid. No, they, they will do that. They'll change the type of vessel that they're on um, to shipping, if they're research, things like that. Uh, it's all just to obscure what they're, what they're really up to. Yeah. Uh, so there's another question coming in from the stream uh, talking about connected devices like uh, Combox or other things like that. Um, and, you know, as is the case with many technology systems, they may have things like default passwords. So the question is there, if you're trying to track, is that an opportunity there? Now, I think the question here is, how could I log into someone's thing? And I wouldn't recommend that because that is uh, kind of <laughs> there. Oh, so um, this but certainly, you know, we could, um, uh, you know, show Dan your friend on that part and I kind of leave it at that. Absolutely. Uh, but uh, are there other options we have to maybe track based upon, because you mentioned looking for equipment and things like that you can see in videos, what else might be useful uh, to help you identify beyond just, okay, they have this type of equipment. How can I use that to maybe pivot to a particular vessel or something like that? Um, I have used, so I don't log into anything. OSIN is passive. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, I, you can, again, you can find things on Shodan if you search for the satellite name, um, Immersat something like that, you can find them. Um, the What I mostly do is find these open things and then report on them. So I'm not, you know, I'm not a pen tester. I mean, I'm not going into these systems. Mm -hmm. I'm not hacking them. I'm just finding them. Um, finding their, you know, if they have a Viasat or, or Immersat or something, I'll, I'll take that, have the picture of it because they take pictures of them and then i'll go to shodan i'll see if it's open i'll go to you know look up if there's any cves on it see if there's any known vulnerabilities for these that i need to report on um, that's the extent of what i do mm -hmm. um, and there are things like we just saw the viasat hack just happened like uh, a week ago so these these are vulnerable i mean they're they're like ships are just like giant ics uh, like floating ICS system. So industrial uh, control system for those who do yes. not know. Yeah. So they're yeah. just as vulnerable as like a pipeline or all these other things that we worry about all the time. Satellite communication stuff, I think in particular, I've heard is, is got some questionable security issues often. Yeah. I mean, and then you just have the crew who, you know, what if you throw a USB stick on the ground or outside of the ship, are they going to plug it in? Then? Maybe. Probably. <laughs> I guarantee <it>, right? <laughs> now there is another question which I probably should have asked earlier. Uh, you had alluded to the fact that you'd sort of accidentally gotten into maritime stuff. Um, and and apparently you are somebody's idol there. That just popped up on the screen. So I, I don't know if you want to uh, on that. But maybe tell us a tiny bit more about how you actually got into maritime. Sure. So, yeah. So when I was starting in OSINT two years ago, <laughs> it was so long ago, um, I I wanted to teach myself these concepts um, that I was seeing all these cool people like Dutch, uh, you know, putting out there, writing blogs on. Um, so to learn them, the only way I can think of doing that is to write a blog on it. And then I'm like, if I can write a blog on it, I could teach somebody about it. And then I'm learning the concept myself, if that makes sense. So I would try and pick things that people may have touched on and not really gone too deep in, or just like taking a different angle on some blogs that were already out there. Because I know in the, in the community, people are always very afraid of writing because other people have done it. But like your, you know, if Dutch writes a blog on something and I write something on the same topic, it's going to be completely different. Exactly. So yeah. that's, that's what I wanted to do is take another angle on something. Um, so I found a few, few things written on Maritime, not a lot. Um, and I was like, oh, that's really cool. I wonder if I can learn anything about it. So I just put together a blog, put it out there, and then people were interested. And I was like, oh, this is maybe this is a thing. Mm -hmm. So I started looking into it more. And then I really got into it. And then people started asking me questions. And, you know, then I started doing it at work and started doing it other places. <laughs> and now, now I'm just like, people ask me all the time about maritime. And I, I very much love it. That is so cool. And I think it shows how, you know, to people new to 
OSINT or interested in getting into OSINT, that a lot of, of what you can do and get into is just maintaining that curiosity mm -hmm. and getting out there and learning. And then all of a sudden you're like Ray and you're like an acknowledged expert in, in this. Which is it's field. crazy to me. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you'll find your own niche. That's basically also mm -hmm. what you're saying. Yeah. Because OSINT is by itself is so broad. You can basically mm -hmm. really get anything and everything if you want. So, uh, so this kind of throws this out for both Ray and Nico. Um, so a question coming in from the stream also asking kind of about operation security or OPSEC. So when you're doing your investigations, you know, Nico, with your background coming from law enforcement, you obviously had certain requirements you wanted to follow. And Ray, for you, I don't know if there's major concerns here. I know if you're kind of working off a third party site, there is a degree of separation, but is there anything you do that's kind of a normal precaution that you follow during your investigations? Yeah, so like you said, third party, um, there is a degree of separation when I'm looking for things, but I always go back to Google. So <laughs> I'm always taking all of these things I find. If I find a ship name, I'm always going to Google it because there might be news articles, there might be links, places people might mention it. So, I I want to do that in somewhere secure. I have you know, VM, a AWS box, whatever you have. Um, I would do that in a secure place because oftentimes it leads to China, it leads to Russia, it leads to you know places you might not want your IP address, <laughs> your information going when you're looking at you know their military or whatever you're looking at. Um, so I definitely do use take precaution. I don't, you know, log into things in my own accounts. I I keep that separation as as well as I can. Yeah. So Nico, anything to add there from your experience? Uh, well, I think for me the the most important part is when I start to look at let's say ship personnel that they could almost immediately find out that someone is looking at them when you visit their profile pages. So this is why I well craft my sock puppet accounts or virtual identities, whatever you like to call them. So I really want to take time to make them look as real as possible and as, and as, as, as alive as possible. And of course I use a VPN connection. I, I keep in mind time zone. So I'm in Europe here. Uh, maybe I'm investigating someone in, uh, Russia or the US, they may be in a different time zone, makes me maybe want to tweak my computer settings or just set an alarm clock and do my investigations during nighttime. Those are all kinds of things that, yeah, I think I never do an investigation without, sometimes I will keep my computer closed so my laptop closed and just take the time, hey, what is the intelligence requirement here? And once I know that, what are the risks that could come into play when I'm trying to find the answer to that? And based upon that, I will um, I grab out a standard procedure that fits that or t custom tailor that. And I would also add that, you know, even beyond the concerns for yourself, uh, using operational security, making sure your sock puppets are well set up and, and all of that, it's important to realize that person being investigated or that realizes someone is sort of looking at them is most likely going to change something. They may be going to do something different and not do what they would have done otherwise if they're aware that they're being observed or monitored somehow. And uh, so kind of along those lines, maybe, maybe you can give us an idea of kind of maybe how you might start an investigation. So for example, one of the big things lately has been the tracking of the yachts that belong mm -hmm. to Russian oligarchs, right? And so that is, you know, there's a lot, there's different pieces to it. There's AIS tracking, there's social media. Can you just describe like how that process might flow uh, in terms of what you do? Not necessarily have to deal into too many details, but just kind of at a high level. Yeah, um, it, it, I think it Depends on what you start with, right? So if are you starting with a picture? Are you starting with the person who owns it? Do you know the company? I mean, they're using shell companies and all these layers of obfuscation to kind of hide what they're doing. Um, I would, uh, plus they're turning off their AI. Oh, well, some of them are turning off their AIs. So you have to verify what you're seeing with photos. Um, usually, if I, if I was tracking these yachts, um, I would see something on Twitter about where they're at, maybe like a general region. I mean, obviously you can't always take Twitter at face value. You have to investigate yourself. So like, uh, you know, I use that as a tipping point to like, you know, cue where I'm going next. So then um, if I'm taking that picture, I want to verify it with a second thing. Maybe there's video of it. 
uh, maybe somebody's, you know, if it's a yacht, maybe they're posting on social media that they're on the yacht or uh, posting something to their family about where they're going. Um, the other side we haven't really talked about yet is the, the corporate recon side of it. Um, who owns these vessels? Um, and a lot of times when we're talking about vessels that do like illicit activity, they have several degrees of separation from, you know, who is actually owning it <laughs> to, to, you know, who runs it behind the scenes. So uh, doing that corporate recon piece where you're going and investigating the, the shell companies, who owns it, who's controlling it, who's servicing it, and then all of their third parties. And then I am a big fan of charts. I like making like I2 charts that <laughs> connect everything. Um, I feel like a crazy person like who has the big string wall. Um, so I, I like doing that, uh, connecting all the companies and you know who's running the company and maybe they're sanctioned and they're connected to another company. So all those connections give little pieces of what you're looking for. And I'm sure these people who are running the yachts are not clean, like completely. I'm sure there are little things that will tip off, you know, where they might be going. Maybe they have family somewhere. Maybe they're going to the Maldives because there's no, you know, extradition or wh whatever. Uh, that's a good hotspot at the moment right now. Eh? The yep. Yes. Yeah. Right. And so along those lines, and maybe for those who aren't familiar with kind of some of the conventions around ships. So, the idea of I can be flagged in one place, but really there's an operating company that's responsible for it and things like that. Can you just give us a quick overview of that as well, Ray? Yeah. So there are flags of convenience. Um, and this means that a, uh, a ship will use a flag of another country if it's convenient to them. Maybe it costs them less. And it's not always like the legal way to do it. Um, they will switch flags. Um, maybe it's a Russian ship doesn't want you to know it's a Russian ship. So it'll use, I don't know, like the, uh, just another flag from another country to hide its identity. Uh, but there are legal reasons, uh, yeah, uh, not yachts, cruise ships often use these mm -hmm. because areas have lower fees. So they will switch to that flag. They will operate out of that area so that they don't have to pay as much for their constant movement. Um, so uh, there's also ship breaking. They don't, <laughs> when a ship has run its course and it's ready to be uh, destroyed, oftentimes they will just park them somewhere and just let them break down, which is kind of, I'm pretty sure that's illegal. Um, <laughs> for the most the, part. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's really bad for the environment. All the oil and all these things can come out of it. They don't want you to know that they did it. So they will change the flag to another country so that you can't trace it back and find them or you know. Yeah. And so when I'm when a vessel is flagged in a particular country, there's some sort of registration information often yes. available from a government agency. And then from there, you can try to pivot out to other data sources. Yes. Yeah. Um, there's patterns. Uh, a lot of maritime activity is spotting patterns. So ships will work in an economic fashion. They want to make money. If they're being legitimate, they want to make money. They have a goal. If you if you monitor these ships over time and they're not doing activities that would make them money, it's worth looking at. <laughs> Uneconomic behavior. Um, so if they're reflagging often, if they're changing their flag, that's kind of a cue that maybe they're not, <laughs> they're not all above board. Um, it, it's worth looking into if if they have a flag that would be concerning. Speaking of patterns, have you ever um, sort of done an investigation not starting from say a ship, but maybe an area of interest and then you're, look, you're looking for maybe, okay, these are false IMO numbers or the AIS number seems to be spoofed or off and then sort of taking it from the other direction? Yeah, this is the hardest way to go <laughs> because I've done uh, where you're just looking at an area. I mean, here's a specific area. Tell us what you can find. Find something. Um, so you basically have to baseline the entire area. You have to watch it historically. You have to watch it over time and see how ships move, what, what normal activity is. And then you have to notice the changes. Um, are all ships always moving one way and this ship stops and loiters in one area for three days. Um, things like that as little changes, give it away, but it takes a lot of monitoring. You have to monitor the whole area over 
quite a period of time. So are you or have a the tool that... triangle? <laughs> <laughs> a valid question. Yes. Yeah. No, I have not looked at the Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> but this is very hard when you're looking at an area with a lot of vessels, like a, a canal or a, a heavy shipping port. Um, you know, around Taiwan where there might be a strange activity all the time <laughs> and you have to figure out what looks weird, what looks different. So I, I have one more question. Um, yeah. And I see that's also in our uh, comment box that uh, are flag semaphores and Morse code still in use with maritime intelligence. So in other words, do, do radio waves or communications, uh, is that still a thing within maritime OSINT? Uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, I think overall the maritime industry is, um, it's high tech and it's not <laughs> a lot like, a lot like, a, a, you know, a lot of our systems, you know, we talk about these pipelines and these things that, you know, uh, have these random hacks and we're like, oh, you know, the, the entire electric grid of LA is going to go down now. Um, we should have thought of that last week. So, like there are there are a lot of things and like comms i'm not i'm not into SIGINT. i don't know that much about you know radio comms but i do know that a lot of things on ships are not up to date they're you know default passwords like you said um they do but maybe use... the other way around I, I know for for a fact you can uh, there's a lot of online scanners that scan for police radios um normal radios do you know that if you can do a similar thing for ships just to see maybe that they are calling to port or something like that you can you can very inexpensively with a raspberry pi build <laughs> and i've done this you can build a thing that creates ais signals um, you could yourself spoof ships um, if you were so inclined. <laughs> you could, um, there's a thing called meekening, which is a, a form of spoofing where you collect the AIS signals, you change them, and you send them back out. So if, I mean, if we're situationally, if I'm a Russian vessel and I my AIS is saying I'm, you know, outside of California, that's going to be a problem. <laughs> but if you're not outside of California and you're where you're supposed to be, um, that's fine. So I'm, as the U.S., if I'm collecting their AIS signal from where they're supposed to be, I could potentially change that to say, oh, this ship's outside of California and broadcast that to everyone. And then the world, you know, it panics and everything goes crazy. So these are things that happen. They are happening all the time. Um, we don't necessarily always hear about it, but there's spoofing, jamming, meekening that's happening at ports and, you know, all these geopolitical situations where it's happening and maybe we don't know because it's you know, top secret or things like right. that. Right, so kind of the idea of in the age of kind of ubiquitous surveillance, the counter surveillance really becomes a major issue at times. Uh, another question that came from our chat, and I think I kind of know the answer here, but I'll go ahead and ask. Uh, if you ever work with something like a submarine, I mean, obviously that's a huge change in order of magnitude. <laughs> you know, if it's surface, great, we can maybe be able to see it somewhere, but otherwise, probably not, right? I mean, yes, subs are pretty hard to track. Um, you do get lucky sometimes and catch them on satellite. Um, very rarely. I have not found any other than, you know, somebody else reporting and me saying, oh, that's interesting and logging it down. Maybe like where they're seen often, things like that. But um, I, they are very hard to track. I have a lot of IMO numbers for them and I have them in a list that I <laughs> look for frequently, but I have not seen them. Yeah. And the, but those are things that are kind of different that you would find more likely on ship spotting uh, sites and stuff. Yes. Too. Yeah, yeah. When they pop up and somebody happens to be there, of yeah. course they're going to post when that. They're out at sea underwater, OSINT wise, good luck. Right? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, this has been a lot of fun. I appreciate everyone joining us today. Um, if you want to learn more, you can absolutely follow Ray at Wondersmith Ray. Uh, our course, the Advanced OSINT course, SEC 587, we do have a module on on vessel tracking specifically, marine tracking. Um, and then there's a lot of open source uh, information out there as well. So I want to say thank you again to Ray 
for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. I'll talk ships any day. <laughs> okay. Well, we might have you back sometime then. Uh, this has been great. Thank you to everybody to, that joined us today. And um, we plan on seeing you again uh, in a month or so and doing another OSINT topic to share some knowledge with another expert in their field. Yeah. And also do not forget uh, in April, there's the SANS OSINT Summit. You can still sign up. Yes. And I will be speaking there. Oh, yes. there so <laughs> for more, for <laughs> more goodness from Ray, come to our summit. <laughs> and, it's always uh, fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.